we believe that consumer protection is crucial to ensure that, you know, all the progress that we've made in the last decade with respect to access to accounts, etc., continues to deliver value. Essentially, it means that we need to develop a way by which people can trust formal financial systems and continue to have positive experience. Let me start this episode with a little plug for podcasting as a communications channel. It's a question I get asked from time to time, whether there is value in building a podcast for brand or personal marketing. And it's not the easiest question for me to answer because it's nuanced and contextual. I don't reach a huge number of ears yet. Please do share the show far and wide. But a typical episode will get 500 to 1,000 downloads in the first month. Maybe a little more if the guest does a nice job of helping to share the content early on when the algorithm is still hungry. But that's not enough to move the needle for most businesses. Certainly not if we treat those ears only as potential clients. So I don't. Instead, I keep an eye on high-value engagements and doors open that might not have been otherwise. Maybe as many as one in three of the completely cold call approaches I make to guests get positive responses. And these are very busy people with little to gain. And after maybe one in three shows... I get to play matchmaker between one guest and someone in my network, or one of my guests plays matchmaker for me with their network. And one of the leaders on that front has been Joffrey Turing. You'll remember him from episode five when we talked about scoring for microfinance. When I just started the show and the download numbers were barely in the teens, Joffrey, the brain behind Credit Insight Analytics, was the first guest I ever reached out to without having some pre-existing relationship. And not only was he generous enough to jump right in and learn with me, he became one of the show's biggest supporters in terms of content sharing, but also in terms of matchmaking. And in fact, he is how I found today's guest, Jayshree Venkatasan, Director of Responsible Finance and Consumer Protection at the Center for Financial Inclusion. Welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan LaGrange. Jayshree Venkatesan, Director of Consumer Protection and Responsible Finance at CFI, Center for Financial Inclusion. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brendan. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Financial inclusion is a topic that I love to discuss on here. Uh, Most of the time, I'm talking to an individual lender who is looking to improve the situation in their unique way. So that's always inspiring to hear, but can only ever be part of the story. You, through your research, have access to a far broader view. So I'm really looking forward to getting myself a bit more educated on the uh, challenges of financial inclusion and what it really means uh, and to hear about your latest research. But before we get into that, you bring to this current role a wealth of diverse experience with Center for Financial Inclusion, but also with the consultative group to assist the poor with the World Bank with some of India's largest private banks, and even as a founder yourself of a mezzanine fund, underlying that fact that you've got your finger on the pulse of the financial inclusion world. Would you mind just expanding a bit on that background and what brought you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. So, So my background and training is very strongly in banking and finance. I joined one of India's largest private sector banks after my MBA. I love finance and the possibilities that it offers. And I decided very early in my career that I want to use the power of finance for greater good. And then there was an opportunity to work with a specialized group within ICSA Bank that focused on areas of development priority. So these were health, education, and microfinance. And so I jumped at it and then briefly worked with a startup that worked on livelihoods. I then moved to a consumer research agency, came back to inclusive finance. And then joined a team that founded this institution called IFMA Trust in India. They're now called Dwara Trust. And several of, of the initial founding team is now responsible for policies and the infrastructure that you see in the inclusive finance space in India. And it was very much an institution that offered space for experimentation. They nurtured intrapreneurs and really allowed us to bring our ideas on financial inclusion alive. 
And so I started on the supply side of financial services and looked at institutional financing. And this was way back in India when, you know, capital markets didn't quite recognize microfinance as a legitimate or reliable asset class. Banks didn't want to lend too much to microfinance institutions. But at the same time, you had private equity that was beginning to flow in. And there was the danger that we sensed that promoter equity would get diluted pretty quickly if they raise capital from private equity investors at that point. And then there was a set of institutions that catered to customers that didn't quite have the wherewithal to attract, you know, mainstream capital. And we ran the risk of leaving a large segment of the population underserved. And so that was the thinking behind launching mezzanine investments, which is how can we provide equity-like capital and make sure that promoter equity is not diluted rapidly, but at the same time allow leverage and allow them to, you know, bring in senior debt and build the processes and systems that are required to grow responsibly. So that was the the origin. My first investment was in the state of Bihar, which is one of the poorest states in India, uh, where Axion was actually the equity provider in the transaction. And that went on. It was successful for a bit. And then the microfinance crisis in India happened. And so the bank stopped lending. Credit rating agencies began asking for higher first loss default guarantees. And that made the MFI business untenable. So we had to restructure our facility to come in as a second loss default player. And that allowed MFIs to access liquidity, allowed us to get profitable. We hit operational profitability, eventually expanded the business to set up the first alternate investment fund. We got the first license from the capital markets regulator. And somewhere around this stage, I realized that I needed to move on because things were stable as far as, you know, the wholesale financing space was concerned. And the government was launching at that point various policies centered on financial inclusion. And there weren't as many entry barriers to the sector as when when I had started. And I needed a new challenge. So I became a consultant and focused on the demand side. Because I realized that in the microfinance world, our tendency was to look at customers as one homogeneous segment, which is obviously not true. And the financial lives of low-income people are you know, much more complex than we can ever imagine. So with CCAP, I worked with, which is a think tank uh, housed within the World Bank. I worked for about five to six years where we focused on understanding what does it take to build a customer-centric business and how do you translate insights on customer lives into relevant products and services in a way that it delivers value to both the customers as well as the business. And that took me to working beyond India, East and West Africa, I worked in Cambodia, Vietnam and the Balkans. And that consulting stint actually gave me the opportunity to understand differences in financial systems across countries and almost be on the ground as various business models were coming to life and understand the emerging risks with rapid digitization. So at the end of that project, I decided I needed to go back to school. So I went well, I went back to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy with the idea that I need to reflect on where the world was going and what are the implications of these changes on the inclusive finance space and how do I deepen and broaden my skills. So I took courses that were more tech and law oriented. I took social network analysis. I studied privacy by design. And then graduated into the pandemic, which is really a point when I think everybody in the sector was all hands on deck. And so I went back to CGAP and I worked on this very innovative study that looked at consumer complaints on social media. And I used social network analysis to scrape and look at what are consumers saying, what are the risks that they are experiencing with respect to digital credit, but also what are the regulatory and supervisory challenges when you're dealing with some of these older issues that credit is normally seen, but now everything is at scale. As I worked on that, it led me to the Center for Financial Inclusion and my current role, where I lead research on consumer protection and responsible markets. So that's my journey. And now you're at CFI, at Center for Financial Inclusion, and I guess to some extent does what it says on the tin, but what does it set out to achieve within the broader financial landscape? So We live in a world today where about one third of the world's adults lack access to formal financial services. And about half of these are women. And on one hand, you know, we have made progress in the last decade. So about 1.2 billion adults have got access to a bank account. We know from the recent GSMA reports that 1.35 registered mobile money users exist. And we know that the pandemic has accelerated access and use in the last two years. 
the problem with the numbers is that access doesn't necessarily translate into financial well-being in the long run or greater resilience. We also know that the pandemic has pushed about 115 million people into extreme poverty and that there are wider inequities both within countries as well as between countries. And so CFI's role as an independent think tank is to conduct research and advocate for evidence-based change to make sure that all of these people that are excluded or newly included can make use of financial products and services to improve their lives and prosper. So that's our vision. Our origins, we are an independent global think tank, but we sit within Axion. We were founded by Axion which has a series of investment funds. And uh, we were set up in 2008 following the IPO of Compartamos, which is the microfinance institution in Mexico. And it was one of Axion's earliest portfolio companies. And Axion decided that they would use the IPO earnings to give back to the community. And so what they created was CFI, which operates as a public good. We focus on four thematic areas, which is consumer protection, data risks and opportunities, women's financial inclusion, and green inclusive finance. And then MSMEs and fintech are cross-cutting areas that cut across all of these four work streams. For me, it's interesting to hear because when I was growing up in, in the industry in South Africa, the government did a big push to get more bank accounts to people. And so the banks created a product and, and rolled it out. But it was kind of, we've done our job uh, and, and now, now we're going back to the real work. And so it's really good to hear that it's gone far beyond that now. And it's thinking about how do these products actually change the lives of the people that they're supposed to serve and not just imagine from somebody sitting in a boardroom in a, in a city somewhere. And also to hear you know, that the extra risks of digitization, it's obviously a whole different world to the surface little scrapings uh, that I know. So yeah, a lot more to this and meets the eye, or at least a typical city-based banker might think of. 100%. And um, <laughs> that work you're doing has obviously been recognized. Your, your roles are, are growing. The IFC has recently transitioned the convening role of the Responsible Finance Forum to CFI. So really embedding you guys in the heart of the discussion between private sector, government, policymaker, academics, to sort of lending organizations as well. So I guess there's two quick questions embedded in that. What is that Responsible Finance Forum? What, and how are you ensuring its value? As you've mentioned now, like we're living in a time where responsible finance is arguably more important than ever. So yeah, maybe if you could expand a little bit on the RFF and uh, how you're helping it to grow. So um, CFI has always been a leader in consumer protection. And today, the consumer protection risks are not just about what happens at the business model level, but also what happens at the market level. And so we recognize the need for these diverse actors, which is, whether it's private sector or investors and donors or regulators to work together and drive critical conversations around the risks that we see emerging. And as an independent think tank, we are uniquely positioned to facilitate these conversations. So RFF is a coalition of global stakeholders that works to equip the inclusive finance sector to assess and manage existing and future risks as they emerge. And there's a longer history to the Responsible Finance Forum or RFF. It was originally created in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and the various microfinance crises that we saw in emerging markets. And it very much intended to bring together the private sector governments, practitioners, policymakers, academics, customer organizations, and so on, to share emerging best practices, solutions, and initiatives to scale up financial inclusion more responsibly. And it was originally convened by the IFC, CGAP, EMZ, the Netherlands Ministry of Finance, in partnership with the wider G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion community. And what it did back then, or since 2009, was convene this annual event that brought together these different stakeholders. We realized that the annual event is going to be crucial to facilitating these conversations, but we also recognize that the complexity of the inclusive finance landscape today demands a slightly different approach. So we've reimagined RFF. What we've done is set up RFF as a platform with three core functions. The first is to aggregate research across the sector and help identify critical and emerging issues that will 
impact low-income customers going forward. The second is to build a network of partnerships that will leverage you know, each other's strengths to build this sectoral knowledge and build on the sectoral knowledge. And the third is regular convening. So the annual event will continue, but then we will have, you know, more frequent contacts, either through webinars or other other mechanisms to make sure that there is this constant knowledge exchange. So that's that's how we've reimagined it. You know, I'll I'll have more information on that closer to the event in June. What we do hope is is that RFF will be this dynamic platform that will help build and exchange knowledge amongst different stakeholders so that you know we're we're coming at these problems with our own unique perspectives, but also building on each other's strengths. Yeah, it sounds like a, a definite force for good. And in terms of your day-to-day work, you're actually fairly new in your current role at CFI, you seem to have hit the ground running. Within that CFI remit, which is broad ranging, what is it that your team is focusing on and you know, people that are watching the work that you produce, what should they be expecting? Yeah, so we believe that consumer protection is crucial to ensure that all the progress that we've made in the last decade with respect to access to accounts, et cetera, which I just you know spoke about, continues to deliver value to Essentially, it means that we need to develop a way by which people can trust formal financial systems and continue to have positive experiences. And if they don't, then there is a way for them to get redress, but in a painless manner. So with this in mind, CFI's consumer protection work stream has three focus areas. We think about emerging consumer protection risks. And this is in the face of global events like the pandemic like climate change, like some of the geopolitical risks that we're seeing in the face of, you know, emerging business models. So platforms with embedded credit, insure tech, everything that's driven by tech. And then ongoing issues of fraud, data protection, consent, you know, price transparency, everything that we've seen historically with consumer protection. So that's as far as the emerging consumer protection risks are concerned. The second bucket is where we think about, well, What kind of market conduct supervision can they have in place? And because regulation is almost always retrospective in nature, you know, there is always a lag between what happens on the ground and what regulation then steps in to address. But we think that with technology, there is an opportunity to elevate the voice of the customers directly and identify risks as close to real time as possible and get proactive about supervision. And you have tools like natural language processing, you have machine learning. When you apply that to existing databases that supervisors might have, that regulators might have, then, you know, there, there's a whole new set of tools that can be developed. And then the third bucket is thinking about protection by design. So the way financial services are designed today is you have UX designers that sit in, in one silo, and then you have compliance departments that sit in another silo and as far away from the UX designers as possible. And then the compliance is usually an afterthought. And is limited to things like KYC, terms and conditions. But what's happening, you know, because the UX designers are trained to design systems that are intuitive, but they're not trained to think about the consumer protection aspect of it. They end up designing interfaces that as a consumer, you might end up using, but inadvertently take on products or risks that are not suitable for your current position at all. So this area of work focuses on breaking the silos between the UI UX designers and the compliance guys so that we can create environments that are designed to protect consumers from the outset. What's really interesting there is that this is very relatable to all lending businesses. So I think back to when I was doing my MBA and we were reading the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. C.K. Prahalat's book. Yeah, in there they were talking about all these clever ways to solve some of the problems that are inherent in having a lack of cash flow and ways to think differently. But in the financial world, that was maybe translated through to something like Grameen Bank, who found a way to work around a lot of infrastructural problems, a lot of problems that came with needing to make very small loans with expensive to serve dispersed populations. And so they did workarounds that were really clever on the ground, but they were interesting to people in developed markets, but weren't really something you would apply in your home market. Whereas, you know, protection of of consumers is something that regulators all around the world are interested in. You know, it's like, are we over lending? Is there a product that's targeting or inadvertently harming vulnerable consumers? All these things, I mean, you're talking about machine learning, NLP, 
these are all tools that every bank is using in the developed world as well. And so while the look and feel might be quite different, there's a lot of lessons, no doubt, that any lender can find in there. And I think also reflective of that sort of much more creative way of thinking through these challenges is one of these studies that you have published with CFI, where you were looking at the resilience of fintechs during the two years of the pandemic that we've had so far. That got me thinking because I'm always talking about digitalization and how the pandemic has spurred a lot of people here to more quickly adopt some online channels or some new models that are mobile first. But those fintechs that are driving that, they, they're causing some behavioral changes in the UK. They're awakening consumers to what's possible. But if that fintech who was the pioneer goes too fast and burns out and disappears from the market, the changes they brought about are going to live there. The banks are copying them. Everybody except maybe the original investors is better off for that innovation. But I would imagine that in these developing markets, because it's the fintechs actually distributing the funds actually on the ground, if these fintechs were to disappear because of all the chaos of COVID and the extra costs and the extra risk concerns that were raised there, this isn't you know, missing out on a luxury. This isn't a change of branding, having to go back to your old bank who's now slightly improved thanks to the challenger. You're back to where you were 10, 20 years ago with no access to, to finance. You took a look at you know, how resilient they are. And yeah. So what was it that you were looking to do and, and what did you find about these fintechs? Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. So there is, there is a little bit of difference between the developed world and the developing world in the sense that uh, regulators and supervisors have to obviously think about or worry about the continuity of these services and you know, what happens if they do exist. In the developing world, there are also other fundamental shifts that need to take place. So our intent when we when we did that research was essentially to find out, well, we know that several fintechs have survived for whatever reason, because you know they were supported adequately by either the policy environment or they were able to pivot very quickly, or you know, their original investors provided them with networks or capital or whatever else was needed. But what does that mean for the customers that they serve or the consumers that they serve? And how did their resilience translate to the resilience of the consumers? There are several other things that need to be addressed. The first is that the legal system needs revamping in several countries to meet the needs of these newer business models. And by that, I mean, we need much more clear laws on insolvency and bankruptcy and what happens when a firm goes under and how do you then continue to protect consumer interests, particularly if, you know, not if you're a credit provider necessarily, but if you're taking savings, for instance, and, you know, you're, you're dealing with consumer money, how do you make sure that their interests continue to be protected? Uh, so that's a policy or legal issue that we will need to address you know, going forward. The second challenge is, is that of trust, because there's a lot more opportunity for frauds or Ponzi schemes. When a firm closes, consumers lose trust. And so the next time they're approached by even a similar firm, there is lower willingness to use these financial services. And here, our focus is on building stronger redress mechanisms, prevent erosion of trust in various ways. And we seek to address regulators or market monitors you know, through that effort. And the third challenge is the continuity of services and experiences. So if a smaller firm serving, for example, the urban poor gets absorbed by a larger bank, not necessarily goes under, but gets you know, merged into a larger institution, will the urban poor continue to remain a segment of strategic interest or will we see some kind of a mission drift? And what is the responsibility of investors and donors to prevent this shift? And, and so what can they do in terms of measuring outcomes and remaining committed to those outcomes, irrespective of you know, where the business decides to pivot. So that's how we think about the long-term implications of, of the work that we're doing in that area. Yeah, it's great to see all the changes, you know, the last 10, 20 years, all these businesses have emerged to solve these problems. But if we don't support them, they could uh, just as quickly disappear. Another pillar that you've already talked about is uh, women's financial empowerment, which wasn't Initially surprising to me, because as I said, I, you know, from my uh, brief exposure to, to the concepts of building financial inclusion in, in the developing world was built around groups of women, micro entrepreneurs to take out a loan and 
you know, I'm not sure we could quite put it this bluntly, but the idea was that if you lent money to the men, they would be far more likely to to spend it on themselves down at the local pub. Whereas if you lent the money to to the woman, more likely to be more responsible and also at redressing some of the sort of inherent imbalances in society. I was looking at the research that you're doing and you start to bring up all these things that really as a sort of a man living in a, in a developed world, it's a huge luxury that didn't enter my mind, but things like being able to carry around a mobile phone and use that for mobile phone banking, all the other broader societal problems that hadn't really come into my mind here. But these are some of those customer protection issues that you've been looking at much more, more carefully. So what are you seeing that can be done to support a safe and secure online environment for women? And why is it so important for financial institutions to be doing so? So the funny thing is that although microfinance is always you know, focused on women-led groups, the group model itself all acted as a black box to hide what went on you know, within the group. And I think the inclusive finance community is waking up to the need for uh, gender disaggregated data and just to understand, does access to financial services really empower women in the way that it's meant to? Does it give her better decision-making abilities within her household? The other thing to keep in mind is that although there's been quite a bit of progress in terms of you know people having access to accounts, either bank accounts or mobile money accounts, the gender gap has remained constant over the last decade. And of course, there are some countries where this is much worse because of the to- social norms that govern financial access and decision making. But in general, it's, it's remained at about 6 to 7%. And that's a problem because it essentially says that something's not working and women are not using financial services that the way that we thought they would use it. Part of the reason could be norms. And of course, there is, there's a great deal of research that's been done in that area. But even when, when women have, you know, higher income levels and higher education levels, we find that they continue to opt disproportionately for informal financial services. So clearly something is broken. And one of the reasons as we experience rapid digitization is the, is the lack of safety or the, the fact that they feel unsafe in online environments. And online environments are unique because they heighten the risks that you can experience in a physical environment. So for instance, if you don't have adequately secure systems, it it can result in identity theft, it can result in stalking, it can lead lead to harassment. And when one grows up in an environment that imposes social censure, there's great reluctance to complain. And even if you have a complaint, assuming you have a complaint mechanism that works and that exists. So even if that exists, it's it's very hard to get women to complain. And often the complaint process puts the person that complains, the woman, in the limelight or investigates the complaint in an insensitive way. And so there is, you know, there is all incentive to stay quiet and just stop using the service. And that's a problem because what we need to see is actually greater use of the service. And that then leading to better life outcomes in some way. Uh, and so there's a lot that needs to be done by policymakers and regulators in creating easier complaint processes to check if the information that's being asked for by lenders is necessary and proportional to the services that they provide. So does a lending app really need access to my phone messages or phone gallery or call records? And if you are accessing that information, then how are you going to use it? Which then leads us to think about data rights. So there's a lot that needs to be done, you know, in unpacking what does a safe and secure online environment mean and how do we create that? Yeah, and I think, again, a nice example of where perhaps the the downside of this process is starker in some of these contexts. but would exist in, in almost every society. So things that might not be obvious problems to a lender in a developed market, but may still exist. And I think that you know, lenders who, who look at the work you're doing and have a deep think about their own products might be able to pick up some ideas and some thoughts on how they can create more inclusive experiences for, for their customers wherever they are. What sort of new challenges are emerging when, when these things go digital? It's a good question. So I would allocate the challenges into two buckets. So there are challenges that arise because of the use of technology. And this may be with customers who may or may not be new to financial services. 
And then there's a second set of challenges that arise with newly included consumers because they're just not familiar with the digital environment. So the tech challenges um, can be of two types. There are, you know, the more traditional risks, which you always see with digital lending, which is, which is now at scale because technology enables that scale. So this sale of products, undisclosed fees, abusive debt collection practices, because, you know, the, the country doesn't have adequate consumer protection laws, you know, so those are the, the older risks, but, you know, which you see now at scale. The second set of challenges are due to what tech itself enables. So synthetic ID fraud, where you see new identities that are being created by combining elements from different IDs. And the impact of that is, you know, some element of your ID is there. And so if you get blacklisted for fraud or, you know, if, if your ID, if the synthetic ID comes up and is, uh, is sort of uh, black marked, then you potentially also get embroiled in a legal suit. And so if you're not familiar with legal processes and you're not familiar with the financial system, this can be, and it can be a massive waste of your time and energy. And then there are AI related biases that come in with digital credit apps that look at different data trails, but the, the, the data trails tend to replicate what society has, you know, in terms of barriers and biases. So the AI related biases simply amplify those biases from the real world. And prevent people from accessing financial services when really you want to enable access to financial services there. So that's as far as the tech is concerned. And then you think about challenges with a newly included consumer segment. And there you deal with issues of lack of familiarity with digital systems and financial systems. So poorly designed interfaces, uh, fraud, especially when you have to rely on another human being like an agent to transact and you you know freely give away your pin and you're not really aware of the risks of doing that or poorly designed redressal systems which you know demand that you need to have a fairly high literacy level or digital literacy level in order to raise a complaint so number of issues there and then finally you have the regulatory gaps and these are arising because of what we call the modularization of financial services so Financial services are being broken up into these different providers. It's almost like division of labor. But not everybody in that supply chain is directly regulated by a financial sector regulator. So if you have a challenge that arises with one of these intermediaries, how do you go about addressing it? And just that gap in the regulatory architecture leads to a whole new set of risks that need to be addressed. And I've said a few times now that that these are far more transferable lessons than they ever were in the past. But if a lender is listening and they're thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me. I'm a brand on a high street in a developed market. What ways can everybody be taking steps to be more responsible lenders? So, so there are really different levels of responsibility. I mean, in a sense, everyone has to be responsible. A good way to think about this is to think about the consumer journey. So at every stage, it is possible to map whether something is broken or not. And then that gives us a sense of the risks that both the consumers face as well as the business faces. For financial service providers or lenders or other stakeholders, they have to think about the impact that they're having on the people that they provide services to. And the advantage of designing processes and systems for the most vulnerable segment is that you end up designing a financial system that is better for everyone. I think they call it the curb cut effect, which is the analogy in the real world is that, you know, as you design curbs or sidewalks to benefit people who use wheelchairs, you end up making the curb better for people who have strollers, people who are biking, and eventually, you know, benefiting a larger population. So a good way to think about financial services and responsibility is the curb cut effect. I remember there's a 99% Invisible podcast episode on, I guess, the inventor of the curb cut, and it's, a, it's an amazing episode. Now I'm talking from memories, it's a little bit dangerous, but I think essentially it was something that was almost forced on cities and then they did it and suddenly saw all those knock-on benefits to all all users of the sidewalk. And uh, yeah, it's a great way to think about it. There's changes we can make and we can be more responsible and <laughs> it just makes the product better. So yeah, it's a lovely way of, of looking at it. And I think you've discussed a lot of interesting topics, well, interesting and important topics. And I'm sure people that are listening 
are going to want to learn a bit more and maybe look at some of those case studies that you've worked on, some of those articles you've written, where should somebody go to find out more about the work you're doing or to learn more about the projects you've completed, some of those ideas that you've raised today? So the first port of call would be the website, which is www centerforfinancialinclusion.org. And then we also have a LinkedIn page where we regularly post information about the new papers and research that we put out. The other thing to think about would be, we spoke about the Responsible Finance Forum and the first event since the relaunch will be held in June. So on June 29th and 30th, and there'll be an announcement about that. But the other anchor event in our portfolio is what we call Financial Inclusion Week which is an annual event. This year, it's being held between October 17th and 20th. It's open to all. It's virtual. So the website for that is www.financialinclusionweek.org. And you will also find recordings of the previous years there. So that's it, it essentially brings together everybody in the sector to tell them, here's what everyone's talking about. Here are issues that you need to worry about. Here are solutions or innovations that people are doing. It's a great one week of it. Yeah, and as you said, it's open to everyone because I think, yeah, I talk to to people in here and a lot of the lenders are trying to bring about some type of financial inclusion, some sort of improved access to credit or often sometimes more responsible lending. And they might not have thought they were welcome. So it's great to hear that, but certainly uh, an event that anybody who's got any focus on improving access to credit or improving the level of responsibility among lenders should keep an eye on. Jayshree, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Overall, a great education for me and an eye-opener. Thank you again. Thanks, Brendan. And thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed that, please do rate and review on your preferred podcast platform and share widely, including on LinkedIn. And while you're there, send me a connection request. The show is written and recorded by myself, Brendan LaGrange, in Brighton, England, and edited with assistance by Kane Hunter. Show music is by I Am Wake, and you can find full written transcripts now in several languages, show notes, and more content at www.howtolendmoneytostrangers.show. And I'll see you again next Thursday. Thursday.